All harbingers except Scaramouche gather together to send La Señora to her last resting place. With the second ever Teva chapter preview, everything green and bubbly with Sumeru got a shade of grey. In this video, I will break down everything that was the Teva chapter interlude teaser, a winter night lasso, explain the Commedia dell'arte persona of each harbinger and speculate on any relevant developments. I guarantee you, when you are done with this video, you will know everything about this teaser. This video was written before patch 2.8, so I will either jump in and add new information or leave them in a pinned comment. We start with a shot of a fire moth created by Senora releasing her true form, struggling to fly through the hail of Niznaya, which symbolizes her once power was now gone. Then we transition into a shot of a chessboard, seemingly played by one person. As later revealed, that person is the number one of the Fatui Harbingers, Piero or Jester. In the same frame, we see two pawns already cut from the Jester's side. This means that there must have been more members of the Harbingers that died before we came to this world. There are 16 pieces on each side of a chessboard, so it makes sense that there were 16 Harbingers once. Next, we saw the board where the white team's rook and the queen has been replaced by the Animo and Geognosis, which Fertui already took. If you pay close attention to the board, only back row pieces left from the Archon side are the king and the three alive original Archons. Even though Makoto was the original Archon, A and Makoto were one in the same for the title of Archon. In the hands of regular paper, the original Archon, Baal, never died. Since other original Archons have died, their pieces are on the side of a board. Also, we see two more bishops cut from the black pieces. So another two members of the Fetue were killed by Celestia before we came. This time, two people with higher value. Other than that, one rook, one knight and two additional pawns have already been cut. Considering the white side follows the rules of only using the original Archons, Black must follow the same rules of only using the original harbingers. Then the jester says, The sages think themselves to be all-knowing, but we alone are wise to the virtue in those acts of folly. The mocking mask from the Pale Flame artifact set says the jester was from Kandria. He tried to convince the king of Kandria to not go against the celestial gods, but due to his social status in Kandria, he got cast aside as a fool by the sages. Now he holds a grudge against them for what fell on Kandria and considers the Fertue wiser than them. As he finishes his sentence, the white knight representing Raiden A cuts a pawn symbolizing Senora's death in the hands of the Raiden Shogun. As Raiden A believed eternity is the closest to the heavenly principles, her peace was next to the king. But after killing Senora and dealing with the traveler, she changed her ways, so she moved away from the heavenly principles. After Raiden's move, the Fatue queen is now in jeopardy. But this queen is not Tsaritsa. Since Tsaritsa is one of the Archons, she should represent the white side. But since she is not the original, she does not have a piece in the board. The cryognosis which the Tsaritsa hold is theorized to be the Rook. But as you can see, the rook is already cut from the board and placed on the side. Later on in the video, the jester says that they will end the current world. As I said in my last theory, Celestia used the Archon War to wipe out the remains of the previous era by killing all the gods except the Archons. As jester said, Checkmate is not where the game ends. The war ends when the current era is completely erased from the existence. So, to end the war, everyone who knew this era should die. Then we see a new harbinger singing a sorrowful tune we hear in the background. The Japanese Genshin Twitter announced all the harbinger's voice actors and their official names. Using that, we can figure out she is the damsel or Columbina from Commedia dell'arte. In Commedia dell'arte, Columbina is one of the servants who is well rounded. She can be as good with money as Pantalone or as knowledgeable as Dottore. She can also be energetic as Arcino or cunning as Brigella. She knows her place lies in her beauty, so she uses that to manipulate the male characters. 
She is capable of everything, a jack of all trades. So I am not surprised if she is in the top 5 ranks. As I explained in my Fatui ranking theory, Harbingers are not ranked according to their strength, but their usefulness to their final goal. Future me here to add some juicy details. In the new patch, Child's voice lines got a major update on all the Harbingers. When he talks about the damsel lady, he says that the Fatui Harbingers are ranked according to their strength. Still, he can't understand why she is number 3, only that she feels ominous. It never specifies this strength ranking is about fighting prowess. So, it could be a strength in their own way to who can help the Fatui better. For example, even though Dodore is an old man who probably can't even walk properly now, he has an army of his younger clones doing his work. You get what I'm saying? But of course, some do become useful because of their overwhelming strength, like Capitano. Cool. Now, don't come after me arguing it's not. If you do, that's just you being stupid. They are basically following the ranking system from the Tuarus series, where level five espers are ranked according to who can become a level six first. Though everyone except this guy who made the system is told it's a simple combat ability ranking. Like that, only the jester and the saritza knows what the rankings actually mean. Don't just take these things at face value. These are what these characters are told, so it's not always reality. That is all I have to add. Take it back, pass me. Fun fact: Colombina always leaves Piero because he is naive and seeks Alecchino. Then we pan towards Pulcinella, explaining the occasion and how the entire nation should stop working for half a day. This shows how cutthroat their work ethics are. Later, Pantalone calls him mayor, so he's the one governing the people of Sniznaya, while Cerica keeps the crown. We can distinguish he is Pulcinella due to his long nose and clothing convention from the previous Tevet chapter preview. He is the man who scouted out Tartaglia, and possibly the man responsible for the Fatui's military. The Commedia dell'arte Pulcinella is a lazy man and is the embodiment of a regular person. But Pulcinella. things to himself everything so he is a wise man he is also very popular if you ask people from napoli his hometown why they would say he is napoli then a man responds by disagreeing with the mayor's decision and ask why only half a day he wears what looks like expensive jewelry and says he is a banker giving away the fact that he is pantalone the commedia character of pantalone is a merchant who is old but rich yet stingy he is a self-made man who accumulated wealth by underhanded methods like tricking the ignorant coincidently during yelan story quest we learn that he goes by the name of regrader this means a person who buys in stock and sells it when the price go high The white mantle that Yelan wears was previously planned by Pantalone as a gift for Cerizza, but Yelan snatched it before Pantalone could get his hands on it. Also, it said that he specifically never received a vision. Pantalone is essentially Ningua, but instead of doing business ethically, he tends to use any method. Intercepting their argument, who seems to be Alecchino, says, "Rosaline died in a foreign land." But you heartless businessmen and dignitaries always with a convenient excuse to remain in the comfort of your homeland. Alekino in Commedia is someone energetic and happy-go-lucky kind of character. He is not immoral, but more amoral. He does not know the difference between good and evil. Because of this, he always tells the truth. He is always paired with the more cunning Brigella and often beats Karamush for being a trash talker. with no weight behind his words he always wears a mask inspired by a monkey a pig or a cat but in every iteration there is a red dot it shows that a horn has been cut from there paired with his other name halekin which is derived from helachin which has the word hell in it he is associated with the devil or a devilish persona similar to that habijur alekino has a cross shaped pupil usually in history anything irregular other than this cross shape was considered devil's work from the hidden quest called the very special fortune slip we learned about aikino and how she is the owner of an orphanage called house of hearts the speciality of this orphans 
is that they are trained to be spies who infiltrate other regions. Her being a caretaker is reflected in how she said, We don't want to make the children cry. While she says this, her eyes slightly move towards the child, using as a double meaning to insult him. But as the Giga Chad he is, Tartalia ignores her insult and puts an hold to the argument. He is the one to always start a fight, but even he has control himself unlike the others, which shows how much self-control he has. His comedia counterpart is someone who stutters a lot, unlike the Harbinger. He is playful, childish and somewhat similar to child's personality, but less threatening. And in theatre, he is often the assistant of the doctor Dottore, but in game, we all know he doesn't play by anyone's rules. Then we pan towards who appears to be the puppeteer, Sandrone. She is being carried by what seems to be a modified version of a ruin guard or a different variant of a ruin automaton from Kandria. Its shoulders have the classic ruin guard inscriptions and its face has the star shape pattern similar to ruin hunters. This robot is smaller than a regular ruin guard but much like a human. Unlike a ruin guard, it has its head above the body instead of being attached. Other ruin guards are mimics of the lava trolls, but this one could be made to mimic a human. Other than that, not much can be said about Sandrone. She is as mysterious as how much she talks. She always seems engrossed in her research. Hmm, I wonder if those machines have anything to do with her. From what we saw, Sandrone was the one talking. It gives the impression that she is disabled and using the puppet as her legs. But usually, the puppet master holds the puppet in their hand while performing, similar to how this automaton is holding the girl. So the robot behind the girl could be the real Sandrone. Even the Sandrone from the Commedia carries two puppets to represent his wife and son. The automaton is the puppeteer, using the maid as the puppet to say what it wants. Then, Capitano said similar meaning words I said in my Fatui ranking video. Senora or any lower ranking members that will shock the Fatui, but it won't hinder their goal like the jesters that might do. In Comedia, Capitano is an outsider. He comes from a different land. Though he looks skilled in combat, he does anything to avoid confronting anyone in a direct battle. In a sense, he is a coward. I wonder how this characteristic will play for the Harbinger since very little is known about him other than Victor would much rather work with him. Then he directs the question of Skaramush having the gnosis and running off to Dottore. This is a foreshadowing that Skaramush is going to appear in again in Sumeru where Dottore is currently stationed. Furthermore, he is responsible for modifying and unlocking the seal A placed on Skaramush to block his divine powers. So Skaramush might seek Dottore in Sumeru to unlock more power with the Gnosis. The Dottore we see here is much different from what we saw in the manga. Dottore seems much more mature than what he was in the manga. And the mask he wears now is nothing like what he wore before. He says, Conventional wisdom holds that divine knowledge cannot be rationally comprehended. Throwing back to what I explained in my Sumeru video, the elixir of knowledge that Sumeran the mushroom speaks of, that is better to be ignored if can't be comprehended. Since the meaning of wisdom is understanding something's true purpose, only someone like the god of wisdom can understand the knowledge of the divine Skaramush is looking for. Again, another reason for Skaramush to seek Sumeru. He has to taste that knowledge for him to look for more. In Commedia Relate, Dottore is a knowledgeable person. He has a knowledge, but even he can't comprehend what he knows. As one of the nobles, he acts with authority. And his actions reflect to show that he is weighed by his knowledge. Before moving on, I would like to take a second to ask you to click that red subscribe button below. Breaking the small talk, Jester enters the room and everyone gathers around La Signora's coffin. Here, we get a better look at Piero's mask and his face. If you look closely, the blue and black patterns on his mask look very similar to Dainsleaf's corruption marks on the right side of his body. And if you really, really look closely, his eye 
has the pointed pupil which he, Kaya and Dayslip share traits. All of them are from Chondria, solidifying the origin of Piero as a survivor from Chondria. I'm sure someone will confuse him with the Bloodstained Knight due to the similarities in the mask. But the Bloodstained Knight was originally from Mondstadt and travelled to Chondria once it was already destroyed. They have a connection with Rosaline's lover 500 years ago. Rostam was his teacher. But Piero was there before Chondria launched the Dark Beast, as I said earlier. Piero got cast aside as a fool in Chondria due to his lack of knowledge compared to the sages. This is reflected in his Commedia dell'arte character. Piero has the personality of someone who is naive, who lacks experience and wisdom. He did lack the rank to convince the king back then, but now he has learned from his mistakes. Reflecting on what I said earlier, next we get a wide angle shot of all the harbingers except Scaramouche, who ran away. Currently, we know the ranks of Piero, the first foot to harbinger, fifth Pulcinella, eighth La Signora, ninth Pantalone, eleventh Tartaglia, and finally Scaramouche, number six. Currently, everyone else is either unknown or yet to be announced. Feel to me here to add a small suspicion I had while editing this part. Although Japan had nothing to do with the Fedue, the Japanese have a specific seating patterns. So like that, could the Harbingers also have a seating order? Hoyovers wouldn't just randomly place characters here, would they? It would make sense if they stood according to their rank closer to the jester. But why are the rank 3rd and the 11th beside him? Colombina is the damsel, meaning a young unmarried woman, and child's Chinese name is Young Lord. So they are basically the young lady and the lord of the Fatue. Maybe I am just seeing things after about 8 hours straight editing this video. Anyway, back to past me. Finally, Jesse says, We will seize authority from the gods. Going back to what I said at the beginning, Fatui's goal is to reset the world again as the Primordial One did to the Dragon's world. For that, they need to take control of the Divine Authority to govern the world and wipe out the remains of the current world. Earlier on, when all the Harbingers were arguing, we got a glimpse of a flag getting frozen bit by bit. Later, when all the Harbingers finished paying their respects, the building in its entirety got frozen solid. This could be the way Saritza shows her respect. Since the palace looks like an orthodox palace, people think it is a Zapoliani palace, the Fatui headquarters. But in actuality, it's a church built to bury La Signora. They wouldn't just freeze their HQ just for her. Jester's words after the building was frozen were all his last words for Rosaline. He says that absolute peace was a gift from the Saritza hinting at how cutting off all emotional ties and freezing the heart, like the Saritza, gives peace of mind. Jester means this as he burns his last emotional bridge, by saying, Your final resting place will be the entirety of the old world. Going back to what I said earlier, he means that only the frozen coffin of Senora will be left of the old world when they are done with their mission. After the title leaves the screen, what sounds like a young woman, probably the dancer lady, compliments Dodore by saying he looks very young, but he refuses to take that as a compliment. Then she proceeds to say, So, where's the segment in the prime of his life then? Four months before we started the game, Dodore looked much younger and more energetic than what we saw in this trailer. He looks much more mature and calm now. But he refuses when someone compliments him by saying he looks very young. And when she asks where the segment is, she asks about someone else's segment in life. This means the two daughters we saw in the manga and the teaser are two different clones of the same person. The original daughter must be much older than what we saw. So he doesn't take a compliment given to a clone so too happily. So when Columbina says his life, he is referring to the original and the segment in the prime of his life is the younger, more energetic version we saw in the manga. They must be linked by a high mind or something, but they are individual daughters from different ages of his life. 
I know it sounds complicated, but Dorore made loans of himself in different stages of his life to do his work. We already know Albedo and his brothers are clones, so it's not a huge leap to say Dorore can also make clones. Considering he modded Skaramush and Immortal within his lifetime, and his dislike towards becoming immortal or extending his life, Dorore must be really old by now. Then we see him looking at a huge tree that is burning down. I don't know what is with these big trees in games and the game devs they wanting to burn them down. As I said in my Sumeru video, the Nalanda University, which is the real life counterpart of Sumeru Academia, got destroyed by Islamic invasions. So there is a high possibility that this scene is a premonition colleague get of the future events of Sumeru. Her Archon residue power was given by Dotore's experiment. So she does have a connection to Dotore. It makes sense why she sees what he is going to do then. And that marks the end of my breakdown of the super exciting teaser, the Tevat chapter interlude teaser of Winter Nights Lazo. And this is a piece of my madness. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. When I started writing the script for this video, I didn't think just 4 minutes and 18 seconds would contain so much foreshadowing and hidden symbolism and such depth. And I am so excited to see my theories are getting some proof now. Nonetheless, it was a really really great teaser. If you think this teaser holds more value, leave a like. Hitting that subscribe button would be much appreciated. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And if you like this video, check out these theories about Sumeru burning down and this theory on how the Fatui Harbingers are ranked. But remember, this is just a theory in a random dude's head on the internet. This was Akamin. As always, thanks for watching and until next time, let your imaginations run wild.